Mining Weekly Online is talking to Johan de Brain, the founding director of Erudite, a new project company that plans to cater for the shift in commodity demand, as well as the swing to smaller projects with a much sharper focus on cost effectiveness. Johan, could you tell us about your unique selling proposition? What, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here once again. Um, we, we came together about a year ago, uh, three technical guys, all out of the industry, for a number of reasons. Um, at a stage of our careers, we, we decided to do something different. Um, got together, we have the, had the support right from the beginning of a strong financial guy, and we asked ourselves, well, what have we got to offer? And it really boils down to a 20-year plus track record for each of us in terms of delivering complex projects in Africa through various, um, various sides of that and from different approaches, so from an engineering point of view, a project management point of view. Um, so uh, sort of deciding and, and agreeing what it is that we have to offer, we then said, okay, how do we make that saleable and how do we put something together that can ultimately also be scaled? And essentially it boiled down to um, in the first place, play a role in the owner side of things, where there are a number of owners in the junior mining space, specifically, and I mean in the larger in the larger miners or the more major mining houses as well, but specifically in the junior mining houses, where there's a real demand for African knowledge and track record and, and real expertise of how do things get done in 50 di 53 different countries with different approaches and different challenges, different logistics and that sort of thing. And it was, the market responded extremely positive. We were met with much excitement when we spoke to junior mining companies saying, uh, there's not really anybody else that offers that. So we had to firstly get something that was unique. We um, do not intend competing with the, the larger project engineering houses. That's more somebody that we'll ultimately work with. But we enable a junior to actually put together a team with the track record and credibility of delivery in Africa. Um, and almost on an on the sh off the shelf basis. So you're not having to commit to employment realities or long term commitments or anything like that. And that particularly was something that was quite attractive to um, mining guys who are trying to get into the space, have their own constraints, and cannot necessarily tackle everything with an expensive budget. And so what about people in <coughs> Australia or Toronto? Can't they fulfill that owner's team ro role that you are offering to these smaller entities that are in Africa and need to be very cost effective? So I think the juniors can offer that or the emerging miners as one um, appropriately calls them. I think they can, but the difference is um, firstly, we're in Africa. Um, so we're in the same time zone and we've got real African experience and knowledge. So it's about the relationships we have with the contractors, with the suppliers, that you know that when you work in Ghana, you use these contractors to achieve this part of the project, but in Liberia, you wouldn't necessarily use them. And logistically, you would tackle this project a little bit different from that one. So I think that certainly juniors can do that themselves, but it doesn't bring them the the bigger expertise and the, and the greater knowledge and of course being in the time zone and being in an African cost base. We certainly, um, when we set off uh, from the start, said to ourselves and to our clients, we don't intend being cheap. Cheap is not something we do, um, but we're in a rand based cost reality. So we are certainly more competitive than, than others and we can offer a real value um, service to the market. And I think that's what it's all about. You know, there's a lot of talk about how's the value created and I think we are able to create real value as a result of that. And there seems to be a commodity shift. Uh, it's not such a huge demand for the bulk commodity projects anymore of coal and iron ore. How are you coping with that? Yes, I think that's, uh, that's, good, uh, um, that's a good point. I think it's very real. I think there's still, there's still some movement in, in the bulk commodity market, but the bulk commodities really kept the industry going for many, many years. And coal has got its challenges but it's still a valuable commodity and there's still a need for that. But I think what we're seeing specifically in the junior mining sector is there's a shift towards um, smaller things, there's a shift towards the battery market. The battery market is particularly sexy these days. Things like um, lithium, vanadium, graphite specifically, um, and also cobalt. I mean, the cobalt price is, is um, seeing some of the most exciting numbers we've seen in a long time. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of focus on that. And, and the challenge is, how does one approach that? 
because if you come from a bulk commodity mindset and you come from a larger project conventional approach mindset, you know, these smaller um, commodities, call them smaller, um, volumetrically in terms of what the market wants, um, it's in a completely different space. So you cannot make projects work on volume. You have to make projects work on value. And there's a lot to be said about first mover advantage and the ability to, to actually deliver into the market without affecting the market negatively. And we're seeing some really interesting things happening in terms of players who put projects together that are seemingly much larger than the market can handle. And yet, if you think about it, there might be some logic behind that where, where we're prepared to buy control of a future market. You know, and I think those are the kinds of things where you know, the industry needs to think a little bit differently about how to approach things. And I think that the, the mining, the history of bulk commodities and large projects have <coughs> yielded an industry. And I, I point the finger at all of us. I'm proudly part of that industry for the last 20 years. But I think from owner to engineer to supplier, there's been, um, there's been a mindset of how to do things on large projects. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that might not be what the market needs now, certainly from a junior mining perspective. Clearly, the bigger players will still do things the way they've always done it, and that might still work for them. But there's a lot of focus on efficiency and how do we, how do, we do things better? How do, we, how do we actually start working off a blank sheet of paper? And I think the Chinese are actually, and the Indians are, are ahead of us in that space because we say we're starting on a blank sheet of paper and we say we're going to do things from first principles, but do we really? Because everybody in the, in, in, the, in the project, from the owner to the drawing office guy who has to put together a concept, they all have 20, 30 years of, of a certain way of thinking. You know, and now we go to the Chinese, we talk to guys who put complex projects together in the beverage industry, and we get them to build a, uh, a mining plant. And suddenly they look at things very differently. They really do start off a blank piece of paper. How does one take this flow sheet put it in a modular space uh, and maybe offer something that's, that is, is completely different. And I, I think the industry is sitting up and taking notice, sometimes reluctantly so, but um, you cannot ignore that there's real value there. And you cannot ignore that the market needs something to be different. Um, and in a previous role where it was all about driving efficiency from a design point of view, it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to take an established, effective design center and, and shift it to think differently. And, and there are ways of doing that, and, and some guys are quite successful at that. But I think there's certainly, a, there's certainly a, an opportunity to come at it from a different angle. Are you competing with the big project house, or can you assist the big project house and mesh with the big project house? Yes, I think um, the consolidation point that you make is, is quite relevant. We certainly don't want to compete with the big project houses. That's not the intention. Um, but I think the whole concept of consolidation is, is creating its own challenges. There's been phenomenal consolidation in the engineering project house space where a small company gets um, consumed by a bigger one and then by a bigger one and then by an even bigger one. Um, and there's a few examples of that. And in some discussions with <coughs> a large engineering company um, only last week, there was um, such a frustration with them sit saying that we're seen as corporate, we're seen as slow, we're seen as expensive. We, we don't think we are, and we do everything to try and counter that. But there's a perception of, of these bigger corporations not necessarily being able to, to offer what the mining industry needs now. Um, and that might be wrong from the mining industry perspective, but there's a reality about consolidation um, that gets to a point that is it still worth it? Who's actually getting the value and who's actually benefiting from that whole consolidation? So from our point of view, I think that creates opportunity. We are in a space where we can move quickly. We can, we can add value in terms of assisting engineering companies thinking differently, but also assisting the owner and even supporting the contractors. And the, and the service providers in, in helping them craft a different way at dealing with or approaching the challenges that the market has these days.
And you know, one of the starting points in Africa for a mining project <coughs> is often where are you going to get the energy? Where are you going to get the electricity from? And now the uh, that energy market is quite complex at the moment because if you're going to look long <coughs> and you give someone a, a, a long um, independent power producer contract, things could change midway. How are you going to cope with that energy challenge? Martin, well, once again, you make a very good point. Uh, we we supporting IPP um, uh, providers out of Europe and, and the UK at the moment in terms of putting together IPP solutions for specifically mining clients, clients where, where, where our expertise lies and our relationships lie. Um, and that is exactly the challenge. So an IPP project typically has a 20-year life and now one has to, um, you have to get the capital discounted over that life cycle, but we all know that there's so much um, technological advancement in the space. Is the solution that we're paying for in 10 years' time still the solution that's going to be appropriate at that time? Um, and that's a very difficult thing to answer. It's almost certainly no, but, but how, do we, how do we fix that from a financial solution point of view? And that, I think, leads enormous opportunity in terms of, once again, finding flexible enough solutions that can deal with that. Because there's no doubt that in 10 years' time, the battery storage capability will be phenomenally better than it is now. And therefore, the overall renewable power solution would be completely different. So now, how do we, how do we put a project together wh which we're going to finance over 20 years? And um, so how I think we add value there is by highlighting that, formulating that in part of a project risk uh, portfolio and saying, well, what is it that one can do and how can you, from a, from a financing point of view, come up with a different approach? And there's some really clever guys out there um, in the financial world who, who knows, know how to do that. Um, that's not really our expertise, but it's more about highlighting that risk and sitting with the owner and saying, well, it's all good and well saying you're about to sign a 20-year contract um, and provide the guarantees for that. But is that necessarily what you want? Should we not break it into smaller components? Should we not look at smaller scale things in anticipation of scenario A, scenario, scenario B? And, and I think that's where, where one um, can tackle it, is by putting a few scenarios in place and saying, well, what if in five years we have that? And what if in 10 years we have that? And can we not perhaps financially model it differently to, to come up with a more appropriate solution? rather than saying, this is what you're going to get, 20-year project, see you in you know, two decades. It doesn't work. You've personally been quite involved in gold in Africa. What are the first commodities that you think <coughs> erudite could become involved in in Africa in this new commodity trend area? Martin, that's a, it's a difficult one to answer, but the, uh, we've also been um, drawn into the battery space, um, and we're quite involved in graphite and vanadium and of late also in, in cobalt and even lithium. So it's a sexy space at the moment. There's lots of people wanting to be in there. Um, and yes, we, we certainly, we're certainly grasping that. And we think it's, it's, it's essential to be part of the new movements of where things are going and, and doing a lot to build our track record also on, on that from, a, from an understanding of the technology, but also understanding the market. I think if you're going to play in the owner space, you have to be so much more than just the engineer. You have to understand the market so you can advise around that. You have to understand um, how things are differently approached in that space because it's not it's not the conventional commodities. It's smaller projects. It's it's smaller product. You know, you used to uh, product being delivered onto the train or onto onto the port, and that's it. It doesn't work like that in the in the, in the um, battery commodities. It's small quantities in small bags delivered to the user. You know, different mindset. So the logistics go beyond the development of the project. The logistics continues all the way to delivery of the actual product. Your company has great South African roots and you are proudly South African. Can you tell us about how you're going to deal with black economic empowerment and other issues along those lines? Right now, I'm pleased you asked that question. As you say, we're very proudly South African. We um, have approached, you know, international junior mining companies, emerging mining companies in terms of helping them deliver projects in Africa. But yes, absolutely um, true blue South African company. We're very proud of that. We um, will hopefully be able to sit with you in the not too, not too distant future and talk a, a little bit about how we have done that. Uh, we set out from day one to, to approach even that a little bit differently. And um, 
I was uh, assisting one of the larger listed entities recently in a discussion around black economic empowerment. And they used the term, which I quite like, about sand and smoke-filled room um, solutions, you know, where, where the, um, I think South Africa, corporate South Africa has managed to find ways of drawing fancy structures on boards and ultimately convincing you that um, you have achieved certain things which, in essence, you haven't. So we are looking at putting our company on the map in terms of being a South African company that fits the requirements of this company uh, of this country, and we we very excited about um, some of the opportunities we have at the moment, and looking forward to talk to you about that in a bit more detail. You're working in a fairly complex industry in a fairly complex continent. How do you mitigate against risk? Martin, Africa is is not a continent without risk. And I think one would be foolish to try and convince the industry or your clients that there are no risks. Where there is value to be added is to, through the track record of delivering projects in Africa, as an understanding of those risks and a, an ability to identify and quantify them, and then ultimately being able to, mit to mitigate them when they, realize, when they actually realize. So I think what we ultimately do as, as engineers and as project deliverers in, prod in, in the mining industry is, I think, is managing the overall risk, so as I said. Understanding it, quantifying it, and then being able to mitigate. The risk is there. It's how we respond to that risk when it materializes that defines our character. And just getting back to the owner's team approach, does this mean that you are an owner's team for many owners, and how do you cope with that? Yes, that's what it boils down to. So we are offering owner's team services for many projects. And, and we need to be careful how we, m how we manage our own growth as a result of that. So we do not want to get spread too thinly. We want to be able to continue to add value as an owner's team. But the team is, is strong enough to be able to do that. We've got quite a bit of depth. And we have the ability to augment that through the relationships that we've got. So. Um, we would like to pride ourselves on the ability to really add value on a project from concept all the way through implementation and by making the owner stronger. And does that mean that you have to be on the board of these various uh, junior mining companies or uh, companies that are owning projects in Africa? Certainly not, Martin. We've been asked to play a role of a non-executive director here and there, but I don't think that is necessary. The, the value that you add, you don't add as necessarily being a director on the board. You can add that value be, by being part of the team. So the owner will have us as their project consultant or their delivery consultant or the Africa consultant, whatever they want to call it, and we just bring that knowledge to the team. So we typically sit in board meetings and, and advise, but you don't have to be a, a board member. And, and I think primarily or, or in general terms, it's, it's better to not be shareholders or being driven by um, share options or that kind of thing, because we want to be independent. We want to be able to say to you, your project, this is what we believe the risks are, and this is how we believe it should be mitigated, um, rather than necessarily wanting to um, just tell you good news, you know, because I think there is a risk of that.